Sen Senator's correct. <clears throat> Mr. President, I'd like to proceed to morning business uh, to briefly discuss two totally different uh, uh, topics, if I may. Mr. President, uh, I rise initially to mark uh, and acknowledge the passing of a, of a good friend of mine. Uh, it may be strange to hear people say that the senator from Delaware, because they're used to so much hyperbole from all of us uh, in the United States Senate and Congress and many in public office, to talk about uh, and believe that someone with, with as uh, disparately different views as Strom Thurmond and I had, that we were good friends. I, uh, I received a call not too many weeks ago from Nancy Thurman, Strom Thurman's wife, telling me that she had just spoken to the senator, and to use Nancy's phrase, she said that Strom was now on God's time, Joe. And I wondered for a moment exactly what she meant she went on to say, he doesn't have much time left. His body is shutting down. And she said that he made a request which both flattered me greatly and saddened me significantly. She said that he asked her to ask me whether or not I would deliver a eulogy for him at his burial, which is going to take place on Tuesday next, this coming Tuesday. And it might come as a surprise to a lot of people on Tuesday when somewhere approaching four or five people, including representatives from Strom's family stand up to speak of him, that I be among those. I am a guy who, as a kid, was energized, angered, emboldened, and outraged all at the same time by the treatment of African Americans in my state a border state, and throughout the South. And the idea that a person like me, not much older than the young pages who are sitting down there now, who literally ran for public office, got involved in public office and politics because I thought I would have the ability to play a little tiny part in ending the awful treatment of African Americans. I was a child in the 50s, in grade school, and uh, in the late 50s into the 60s in high school. And as hard as it is to believe now, that was an era where when you turned on your television, you were as likely to see Bull Connor and his German Shepherd dogs attacking black women marching after church on Sunday to protest their circumstance, or see George Wallace standing in a doorway of a university, or Orville Faubus. This all started, since even to my consciousness, when I was uh, in grade school, as it did, I suspect, for everyone of my generation. And <clears throat> it animated my interest, and as I said, my anger. And I wasn't merely intellectually repelled by what was going on in the South, particularly at the time. I was, as probably a legitimate criticism of me, I was angry 
about it and outraged about it. <laughs> and the idea that I would come to the United States Senate at age 29, well, to be precise, I got elected at age 29. By the time I got sworn in, I had turned 30. And two years later, be serving on a committee with J. Strom Thurmond, him the most senior Republican, and me the most junior not only Democrat, but junior member of the committee, that over the next 28 years, he and I would become friends. He and I would, on some instances, have an intimate relationship. The idea that um, my daughter, who is a 22-year-old grown woman now, but to this day, in the bedroom in our home, her bedroom, would have one picture hanging, or actually sitting on her dresser, of all the pictures as a child who, the moment she was born, her father was a senator. And her entire life, I've been a senator. She's had the privilege of being able to meet uh, senators and presidents and kings and queens. And she has one picture sitting on her bureau, which startled me when I realized it the other night. She doesn't live at home. She's, like all young people, out on her own. <laughs> There's a picture of she and Strom Thurmond taken when she was nine years old, sitting on her desk. Now again, if you had told me, first of all, if you had told me when I was 20 years old I was ever going to have a child, I would have found it hard to believe. But if you had told me when I was 29 years old, when I did have two children, that one of my children, as I approached the Senate, would roughly 30 years later have a childhood picture of she or he in Strom Thurmond's office, standing next to his desk with his arm around her, that was kept on her bureau, I would have said, you've insulted me. Don't do that. And the only point I want to make today, because I do not intend at this moment to attempt to eulogize Strom, is that I think that one of the incredible aspects of our democracy, even more precisely, our government, our governmental system that is lost today on so many, is that it has built into it the mechanisms that allow you not only to see the worst in what you abhor and fight it, but see the best in people with whom you have very profound philosophic disagreement. There's an old expression <clears throat> that politics made strange bedfellows that is read today by most young people or anyone who hears it as meaning what it maybe initially meant, that they're strange bedfellows because people need things from each other and they compromise. And so out of self-interest, you end up being aligned with someone with whom you disagree, out of self-interest. But the majesty of this place in which I stand, this United States Senate, the floor of this place, the floor of the Senate at this moment, is it has another impact on people that I don't think many historians have written very well about. And I think it's almost hard to understand 
and even harder to articulate. And that is that it produces relationships that are a consequence of you looking at the best in your opponent, the best in the people with whom you serve, the best about their nature. I remember as a young senator, I guess I was 31, wandering on the floor one day. New senators will not like what I'm about to say, but when you're a newer senator, you have less hectic Senate responsibilities than you do when you're a more senior senator. Not, you're no less important. You just, you're, you don't have to, being chairman of a committee uh, gives you the honor of turning the lights on and turning them off, meaning you're the first and last there. When you're not a senior member, you're not required to do that as much. And so I was wandering literally onto the floor like my friend from Montana just has. And, and there was a debate going on where one of my colleagues, who also became a friend, was railing against something I felt very strongly about. And at the time, uh, because of the circumstances in which I got here, I, uh, I uh, was meeting regularly once a week with one of the finest men I ever knew, then majority leader, Senator Mike Mansfield. When I had gotten here, between the date I got elected and the date I arrived, my wife and daughter were killed in an automobile accident. And I wasn't crazy about being here. And Senator Mansfield was a um, great man that he was, took on the role of sort of Dutch uncle for me and would tell me what my responsibility was and why I should stay in the Senate. And then, without my knowing it really at the time, looking back on it, it was crystal clear, uh, would ask me to come and meet with him in his office once a week and uh, talk about what was, I was doing. But he acted like I was, you know, sort of he was the principal and I was the young teacher and I was coming to tell him about how my classes were going. But really what it was is just to take my pulse and see how I was doing. Anyway, I walked in the floor one day and a particular friend of mine, Jesse Helms, he's become a close friend. God love him, he's in North Carolina now in retirement. And he was going on about something I had very, very, very serious disagreement with. As I walked into Senator Mansfield's office, which was out that door, and, uh, um, and I sat down with him. He said, well, how's it going? And I began to rail about how could this senator say such and such a thing. It had to do with the uh, Americans with Disability Act, or what was being discussed then. And Senator Mansfield, in his way, just let me go on and then said, Joe, and I will not bore you with the whole story, because this relates to Strom. He said, Joe, he said, you should understand one thing. And he told me the story about Harry Truman. And when Harry Truman first got to the United States Senate, I'll paraphrase this, wrote back to his wife, Bess, and said, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe how I got here with all these great men, paraphrasing. And apparently, not long thereafter, he wrote back to Bess and said he couldn't understand how all these other guys got here. Well, he told me that story and he said, let me tell you, every single solitary man and woman with whom you'll serve in the Senate has something very special that their constituency sees in them. And your job is to look for that. I can't imagine anybody saying that today, can you? I can't imagine in this raw political environment we're in, 
somebody having the insight Mike Mansfield had and telling a, a novitiate, if you will, a new young senator that part of my job was to look for that thing in my colleague, a colleague with whom I had bitter disagreement, to look for that thing in him that his constituency recognized, which was special, and sent him here. Well, maybe subconsciously, because of that, I became one of Strom Thurmond's close friends. And as his AA for many years will tell you, one of his protectors, especially as he got older. Because Mike Mansfield's right, and I never called Mike Mansfield Mike, I'm standing here as a senior senator saying, Mike Mansfield, I never called him Mike <laughs> to the day he died. I called him Mr. Leader. And Strom Thurmond, Strom Thurmond had a very, very special piece of him that his constituents saw that it had nothing to do with the most celebrated aspects of his career. And the most celebrated aspects of his career are the ones that I abhor the most the filibuster to fight civil rights and to keep black Americans in the shadow of white Americans. We're signing the Southern Manifesto. It's funny, I say to my friend from Montana, for a guy who came here, I've sort of got tied up with a lot of Southerners. Senator John Stennis became my friend. I have his office. I have the table that he presented to me in the conference room that had been Richard Russell's, upon which I'm told the Southern Manifesto was signed. I might note parenthetically, if you all know John Stennis, those who knew him, he talked at you like this all the time, and he would hold his hand like this. And when I was looking through his office, when he was leaving to see whether to take his office because of my seniority, he told me, he reminded me the first time I came by his office as a young senator paying my respects, which was a tradition then. And I sat down at that conference table, which he used as his office desk. And he patted the leather chair next to me. He said, sit down, son, sit down. And he said, what made you run for the Senate after congratulating me? And like a darn fool, I told him the exact truth. I said, civil rights, sir. As soon as I said it, I could feel the beads of sweat pop out of my head, and my underarms get damp. Like, what am I telling this old segregationist for? That the reason I ran was civil rights. That's not a very auspicious way to start off a relationship. And he looked at me and said, good, good, good. And that was the end of the conversation. Well, over the intervening years, we served 18 years, and we shared a hospital room and Walter Reed for three months, and he was in there as I was, and he became as supportive of me in my effort to run for president and back in the 80s, and we became good friends. But 18 years later, when I came back, to look at his office to see whether or not I would take his office because it was a more commodious space. And uh, I walked into the office. It was during that interregnum period when um, between the presidential election and President Bush was about to take office. And there had been this transition at any rate. I said to his secretary of many, many years, and I'm embarrassed, I can't remember her first name, I think it may have been Mildred. And he was in the Senate, I think, 42 years, maybe 43. And, and I said, is the chairman in, as I walked into his office? He said, no, no, Senator, you go right in and look at his office. 
And I walked in, and who's sitting in the same spot he was 18 years earlier, only this time in a wheelchair with an amputated leg, was, Trump, was uh, John Stennis. And I said, oh, Mr. Chairman, I said, I apologize. He said, no, oh, come in, sit down, sit down. I patted the chair. I sat down, and he startled me. He said, do you all remember the first time you came to see me, Joe? And I hadn't. And he reminded me. And I looked at him, and he recited the story. And I said, I was a pretty smart fellow, wasn't I, Mr. Chairman? And he said, and I give you my word to this, he said, I wanted to tell you something then that I'm going to tell you now. He said, you are going to take my office, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. And he caressed that table. It was a big mahogany table, about half the size of the table in the cabinet room, as if it were an animate object. He said, you see this table, Joe? I said, yes, Mr. Chairman. See, this table was the flagship of the Confederacy from 1954 to 1968. He said, Senator Russell would have us every uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I forget what day, and we'd have lunch here. And he said, everybody had a drawer, and there's these drawers around the table. He opened one drawer. He said, we planned the demise of the Civil Rights Movement at this table. He said, it's time now that this table go from the table of a man against civil rights to the table owned by a man for civil rights. Give you my word to that. And I was moved by that. And I looked at him, and he said, one more thing, Joe, before you leave. He said, the Civil Rights Movement did more to free the white man than it did the black man. And I said, how's that, Mr. Chairman? And none of you here are old enough to remember him, but again, the way he talked, he went like this. He said, it freed my soul. It freed my soul. The point I want to make that I'm grappling with here is that the men and women serve here, and Strom Thurmond in particular, actually change. They actually grow. They actually, because of the diverse views that are here and different geography we represent, if you're here long enough, it rubs against you. It sort of polishes you. Not in the way of polish meaning smooth, but polishes you in the sense of taking off the edges and understanding, understanding the other man's perspective. I believe Strom Thurmond was a captive of his era, his age, and his geography. I do not believe Strom Thurmond at his core was a racist. But even if he had been, I believe that he changed, and all the news media says now, he changed, they think, out of pure opportunism. I believe he changed because the times changed. Life changed. He worked with, he saw, he had relationships with people who educated him as well as I've been educated. Hubert Humphrey wrote a book, and I had the great honor of serving with him. It was entitled, The Education of a Public Man. I watched Strom Thurmond as the percent of his staff increased in terms of black representation. He and I were chairman or co-chairman of the Judiciary Committee for almost two decades, 16 years, I believe it was, I watched him. He would lean over to me in the middle of a hearing because we had a genuine trust, and he'd say, Joe, what'd they mean by that? I'll never forget him asking me. We were holding a hearing in the Supreme Court Justice, and at the end, the last bivy of witnesses we had, we had six witnesses, included a 
young man who was representing the Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And he was chairing it, and I was the only one with him because the hearing, I think it was the Rehnquist hearing, was already finished. And these were people coming to register their opposition or their support. And they ranged from all kinds of groups that were before us, extremely conservative, extremely liberal, to give everybody their say, their day. But the rest of the committee knew the hearing was basically over. And because, again, turning the lights on and turning the lights off, you're the ranking Democrat or the chairman or the ranking Republican or the chairman, you got to be there. And I'll never forget, I was sitting next to him and he leaned over and he said, what's he saying? And this young man was explaining the point of view of why, in fact, to be gay was not, was not to be in any way maladjusted. But Strom came from an era and a time that he looked at the young man and he said, have you received psychiatric help, son? Now, to everybody in that room who was under the age of 40, they laughed and thought he's being a wise guy. He was serious. He was serious. He leaned over to me and he said, Joe, why do they call it gay? He wasn't being snide. He literally, at 90, I guess it was then, 91 years old or whatever it was. So it must, mustn't have been Rehnquist, it must have been someone later. He didn't understand. He did not understand. Remember, this man was over 100 years old. Came from the deep south. People from the far north don't understand either. I don't mean to imply because he's, but he came from an environment They were so different. But this place, this place, over time, he had the ability, without even knowing it, to apply Mike Mansfield's standard, which was to look at the other guy or the other woman and wonder and try to figure out what is the good thing about them that caused their people to send them here with all their warts with all their foibles, with all our faults. I, uh, I deem it a privilege to have become his friend. I was, I guess we were equals in the sense that we had our vote counted the same. Our influence on some issues was the same. But I am 60 and he's 100. There was always a 40-year chasm between us. And uh, I could say things to Strom and be irreverent with him. I could grab him by the arm and say, Strom, don't which I wouldn't have been able to do had there been a 10-year difference. I was like the kid. And it's strange. I find it strange even talking about it. How this relationship that started in stark adversarial confrontation ended up being as close as it was, causing Strom Thurmond to say, uh, ask his wife whether I would deliver a eulogy for him. I don't fully understand it, but I do know it's something about this place. It's something about this place these walls, this chamber. And there's something good about America. Something good about our system. And it's something that is sorely needed to look in the eyes of your adversary 
within our system and look for the good in him and not just the part that you find disagreeable or in some cases abhorrent. I'll end on a more humorous note. <clears throat> I had the privilege of being asked as one of the four people to speak at his 90th birthday. The other people were George Mitchell, who was then the majority leader, a fine man, Joe Biden, Bob Dole, and Richard Milhouse Nixon. And it was before a crowd of a thousand or more people in black tie here in Washington. It was quite an event. It kind of shocked everybody that I was asked to be one of the speakers, I think, the group that was there. It shocked me to be sitting with Richard Milhouse Nixon, even though he was president when I arrived here. And uh, I did some research about Strom to find out about his background before I did this tribute on his 90th birthday, which was a combination of a tribute and a roast. You know what I found? I found a lead editorial, I don't have it in front of me now, memory serves me, I think it was 1947 or 1948, from the New York Times. And the title, if memory serves me correct, was something like this, of the lead editorial was, The Hope of the South. It was about Strom Thurmond. The New York Times, the liberal New York Times, in the late 40s, before, it must have been 47, but before the Dixiecrat event and him walking out, wrote about this guy, Strom Thurmond, who was a public official in South Carolina who got himself in trouble and lost a primary because he was too empathetic to African Americans. Because when he was a presiding judge, he started an effort statewide in South Carolina that tried to get better textbooks and material into black schools, and he tutored young blacks and set up an organization to tutor and teach young blacks how to read. Strom Thurmond. Strom Thurmond. I think it was 1946 or 47. And the essence of the editorial in the New York Times was, this is the hope of the South. In the meantime, he got beat by a sitting senator for being, quote, weak on race. I think Strom Thurmond learned the wrong political lesson from that and decided no one ever get to the right of him on this issue again. But I also was sitting next to him when he voted for the Voting Rights Act and the, extent, the extension of the Voting Rights Act. And so, the only point I want to make is people change, people grow, and people react to crises different ways. I choose to remember Strom Thurmond in his last 15 years as senator than I choose to remember him when he started his career. And I don't choose that just as a matter of convenience. I choose that because I believe men and women can grow. I believe John Stennis meant it when he said the Civil Rights Movement saved his soul. I believe Strom Thurmond meant it when he hired so many African Americans signed on to the extension of the Voting Rights Act, and voted for Martin Luther King Holiday. I choose to believe that he meant it. Because I find it hard to believe in the so many decent, 
generous, and personal acts that he did for me did not come from a man who was basically a decent, good man. And the latter part of his career reflects that. So I choose it not just because I'm an optimist. I choose it not just because I want to believe it. I choose it not just because I believe that there is a chemistry that happens in this body. I choose it because I believe basically in the goodness of human nature and it will out. And I think it did in strong. I'll have more to say, or less to say, but hopefully more succinctly and more in a more articulate way uh, at his funeral. I'll close by saying to Nancy and Strom Jr. and all of his children how much I cared about their father, how much in a strange way he taught me, and how much I hope he learned from those of us who disagreed so much with his policy on race. And uh, the human side of this can never be lost. They lost blood of their blood, bone of their bone. And it's a tough time. But I am flattered that you asked me, and he asked me, and I just hope that I and others are worthy of his memory when we speak of him on Tuesday. Mr. President, I had come today, planned yesterday to be here today to speak about a totally different subject until we learned last evening what happened to Strom. So with the permission of my colleagues, I would like to uh, move for a few minutes to a totally different subject.